Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies. And welcome to this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner. And ladies and gentlemen, this latest episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner, as far as I'm concerned, is something that's actually been very, very long overdue. And that is data acquisition. What you need to log from a chassis perspective. And I think particularly where we find ourselves in the current motorsport environment, what we're about to discuss is not just timely, but incredibly necessary. So let's hook into it. Okay, so when it comes to data acquisition, one of the biggest misnomers that I see out there is the fact that data acquisition, it's costly, it bogs everyone down, it's a total waste of time, particularly, and you can see that attitude burbling just below the surface with a lot of set of a lot of mid to senior level um, formula and really part of the goal of today's presentation is to really show that th that up for what it is and that's a complete and utter fallacy so when we look at the chassis side of things which is going to be our focus for today it that list of what you're going to need in terms of the cost value of what you're going to need is not as extensive as you think so we're going to discuss what you need to log and then i'm going to give you a rough outline of what you can do with it so let's get started okay so to get things rolling uh, let's introduce this via um the via what we need with the chassis in monster file now this is something that i have spoken about at length in um various chassis sim tutorials with regards to what the monster file is, um, what you need, uh, what, what it needs to do, and also too, it's something I speak about at length in the chassis sim boot camps. But to paraphrase my Australian dealer, Pat Cahill, if you ever want a list of what you actually need to log from a chassis perspective, the chassis sim monster file pretty much nails it. So here we've got a data file exported at 50 hertz, We've got disk, lap distance, RPM, lap G, longitudinal, um, your damper pots, um, steer sensor, throttle, and, and uh, vehicle speed. And that pretty much, if you want to look at a list of what you need to cover from a chassis perspective, that is a great introduction, which leads me to this list here, which you can pretty much take as your master list of what you need to do to get going in terms of logging from a chassis perspective. Now, I'd encourage you all to take a screenshot of this while I speak about the significance of all of these channels. So I'll let you do that while I'm talking. So first things first, engine RPM. So that's a complete no brainer. Engine temp, oil pressure, that's a, uh, that's a complete no brainer. Vehicle speed, that's also a total no brainer as well. Um, lateral inline and vertical G. That is also something that's also necessary as well. And you, or particularly for lateral inline and vertical, you want to be logging that at about 200 hertz. Steering, absolutely, uh, uh, steering, absolutely essential. You want to be logging that at about 50 hertz. Throttle is also about 50 hertz. Um, your front and rear brake pressure, that goes without saying, because without that, your driver is basically flying blind gear position sensor that's obviously something that's also very important you want your damper pots logged at about 200 hertz now just a quick one on the chassis and monster file being exported at 50 hertz and while we've got this at 200 hertz 50 hertz is what chassis sim needs now the reason we only go to 50 hertz is basically due to the frequency response that i talk about in the shaker rig gum tutorial videos but the reason you want to log at 200 hertz for actual damper is to make sure that you nail absolutely um, everything and the last thing you need to log is gps altitude that pretty much ladies and gentlemen is the master list of what you're going to be after now the reason that you want this is i i often look at good data acquisition is the equivalent of going to two doctors. One doctor, you walk in the room, they're wearing a nice white coat, they've got the degrees hanging on the wall, they've got a stethoscope, they've got all the referrals to get you for all the appropriate um, measuring equipment like an MRI, X-ray, ultrasound, whatever. You know, they listen to your problem, they give you a prescription. You don't think about um, taking that prescription and running to the pharmacy so you can get better. Why? Because they've got all of the knowledge, but they've also got all the measuring equipment to classify what is wrong with you. Second doctor, you walk in there, they are wearing something that they are wearing this really, really weird 
tree garment and stuff. They're shaking various body parts over a voodoo doll. And before you know it, you got your diagnosis. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to that second doctor, I don't care whether I got my arm blown off. I will be out that door absolutely supersonic. Same principle here. Your da good data is your window to what is going on with the racing car. And to illustrate that, let's talk about what you can actually use that for. Okay, first things first, figuring out ride heights. Now, you pretty much every damper pot on your car is a load cell. Now, this is something I've spoken about at length in various other tutorials, but a quick summary is your force on the spring is your spring and your spring rate and damper functions times the motion ratio where motion ratio is damper on wheel. Now from this, and here's the nail here, you can use this to figure out what the wheel move, move, movement is. If you've um, calibrated out what your tire pressure is, if you've actually measured that um, on a rig. And to be quite honest, sure, you could do it on a K and C rig, but honestly, any rig where you've got any sort of load where you're actually measuring the deflection will do. You've got um, your platform displacement, which is your spring displacement, divided by the motion ratio, plus your wheel movement. So that is your total combined wheel movement. And from that, you can figure out your ride heights. Now, I have had customers in the past who have done this, who've pretty much been in the ballpark by about plus or minus a mil. So this gets you right in the ballpark. So what we're doing here is we're taking this data and we're really drilling down very quickly into what the car is doing. The other um, example of this is calculating your aero loads. Now, this is something that um, I speak about at length um, in a lot of the boot camps I've given, in particular, or a lot of lectures I've given at the universities, where I give you race data and I get you to figure out what the, um, what the aero um, the coefficients of the car are. And that all comes out from good calibrated data. There's no shortcuts to this, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely no shortcuts. But again, that all comes from that list we've just outlined. Um, uh, uh, we've just outlined below. And lastly, you can use this data to figuring out your tire model. Now, this is again something I speak about at length in the chassis and boot camps. I've also spoken about at length at um, various um, tutorials on the chassis and YouTube channel, but. I can tell you right now, good data sets you up for correlation like this. So actual is colored, simulated is black. So we've got speed, throttle, front dampers, rear dampers, steered, uh, um, steered angle um, at the tire, lateral G, longitudinal G, um, front and rear roll. That all comes out in the wash and is the bedrock of having good, calibra uh, good calibrated data. And make no mistake, folks, one of the worst kept secrets when it comes to doing um, tire modeling, while tire test rigs are fantastic for comparing compound A to compound B to compound C, where they struggle is when you try and apply those results directly to track. So to an extent, once you've got good data and a tool like the Chassis Tire Force Modeling Toolbox built on the bedrock of good data, this all pops out in the wash, which makes any tire testing you do infinitely more valuable. So, and all of that comes from that list there. That's your bedrock. So, let's now address the elephant in the room. Is this as costly as everyone thinks? And it's a very good question. Uh, uh, is this as costly as everyone thinks? Because you will see, God knows, how many regulatory authorities try to argue this case, you will see, um, uh, uh, and you'll see that burbling surface, uh, that, that burbling attitude just burbling between the surface that, oh, we really don't need this, it's too costly, etc., etc. Well, let's take a look at a cost breakdown of all of the, uh, uh, of all of those um, sensors with a good logger to log it. And for, and what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna quote this in Australian, uh, I'm gonna quote this in Australian dollars. So a Motec ADL free will be about five grand, give or take. A, a good free access G meter will be about $1,200 um, AUD, give or take. Okay, four starter damper pots will set you back for a set of four, it'll be about $400, um, give or take. Steering sensor is about 200, throttle's about 200, temp sensor for your engine's about 200, Pressure sensor is about 400. Brake pressure sensor is about another 200. GPS package, about 400. So by the time you've added that all up, 
you're looking at about 10 grand AUD, give or take. Um, now, a couple of observations about what we've just um, discussed here. Number one, it's ballpark, so um, don't take this as a um, uh, definitive quote. But more importantly, particularly with things like damper pots, etc., etc., you can start simple and get cute later. You don't have to go for for uh, you don't have to go for the ten grand sensors up front. And particularly, I want to mention this um, to those of you who are running in the junior formula, who are running in club formula. It's really tempting that you think when you look at a, uh, when you look at a complete data acquisition suite to go, oh my god, oh my god, it's all too expensive, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The key thing is to start on the fundamentals, right? You start on on some basic sensors, then as the money comes in, you slowly upgrade um, those sensors. But you want to have that, uh, um, uh, but you want to have that bedrock too. Now, my second comment is to those regulatory authorities tuning in here. Who think that uh, um, who just love who have got data acquisition and banning it in their sites? Okay, your typical uh, okay a typical GT free spend is going to be well north of about five hundred grand USD for an entry level car, give or take. I mean, sometimes it'll be a bit more, sometimes it's going to uh, sometimes it'll be a bit uh, be a, be a bit less. But you know what? I'm feeling generous today. Let's drop it down to two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, to about 250,000 US. So my question to you is this, everything we've just outlined there is about 10 grand or about one in 20, or a factor of one in 25 of um, the cost of the vehicle. Yet it gives a race team the ability to go through and look at their data using nothing more than their smarts to figure out what the hell's going on in the car. So my question to any regulatory authority or indeed any skeptic Tuning to this, I'm genuinely curious. How does that spoil the show? And it's a genuine question. So, moving on. What do you need to do to take this over the top? What do we need to log that, so that we can nail absolutely everything that's going on with the car? Okay, so so we have pitot speed, and that's really good for when you start doing things like aero testing. Now, you can get away quite a bit with just your logged, um, so, uh, with the combination of your rub log speed and the fact that you've got a good weather sensor and a good uh, and um, you've got a um, wind model set up um, for the circuit, like the chassis mirror toolbox does that quite well. Then there are your rub load cells um, for all four corners of the car. Now, just a quick note on load cells um, for the car. I think they're a var valuable tool, but load cells for a car are very much like fish and chips or romantic movies. They're either really, really good or they're really, really bad and there's no in between. So particularly with regards to your load cells, don't skimp. Um, then you need your lasers um, for front and rear ride heights. Typically what you'll have to do is you'll use about three of them. So typically you'll do two at the front to help measure your roll and you'll do one, uh, and you'll do one at the rear, particularly for open wheelers. It just is a bit more convenient to um, mount it um, that way. Then you're talking your internal tire temps and your external tire temp sensors, um, and your um, and particularly your pressure sensors. Now, um, BF1 systems do do some great work um, with regards to that, um, and with regards um, to um, your rate um, and also to a your rate sensor really takes you over the top in terms of figuring out what's doing with the car. So you combine that table with the other table we discussed, and you've basically got everything you need to race engineer your car to the nth degree. And if we take a look at the dollar value of this, there's one of the great uh, myths that we often hear is, oh, wow, we gotta spend 50 grand on data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in order to really nail every nuance of the car. I can tell you right now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is total nonsense. Everything that I've just outlined um, in our initial table and this table allows you to get there. And I will defer to guys like um, uh, TechSense um, and um, your um, typical MoTeC AIM dealers um, to to nail this down. But your uh, but uh, a rough rule of thumb, you'd probably be looking for the complete um, gold plated package, maybe twenty twenty five grand AUD now. Let's put this in, in perspective. I mean, a brand new rolling chassis um, for something like a, um, a, a supercar, 
a DTM car, you're looking at at least probably half a million Oz um, for a uh, for the latest Gen 3 supercar. And of course, I um, invite anyone to correct me on that. A DTM car would probably be about half a million euro, give or take. So again, why is this such an onerous expense when it gives you the ability to use your smarts to figure out what's going on with the car? Now, who should you be talking to? First, first, first. For um, the loggers, any de uh, any decent Motec or AIM dealer. Now, the reason um, that I say that is that um, Motec or AIM pretty much will cover you for things like club motorsport right through, even to your mid-level and advanced sports. That being said, Cosworth and Morelli are definitely also worth a chat as well. The only thing that I will say about Cosworth and Morelli is because of their price point, they tend to land at the mid-level formulas and above, and that's just uh, uh, and that is just the nature of the beast. The other, the other guys you should be talking to is TechSense, uh, particularly if you're based in the United States. A so big shout out to TechSense um, uh, USA. They've got a great array of sensors to choose from. Um, BF1 Systems also have a really good array of tire temp, tire pressure sensors um, uh, that you can choose um, from. So they're located in the UK and they're definitely um, worth a look. But honestly, any decent Motec Arrain dealer, um, and the only reason I mention that is not because of my undying love for Motec or um, AIM. It's just with the way that things have lo have um, the way that things have worked out. They're basically probably the most numerous. So any decent dealer who deals with other Motec or AIM should give you a really good steer in terms of specking out what you actually uh, uh, of specking out um, what you actually need. So. Let's um, sum this up, some conclusion and some parting thoughts. Okay, first things first. Data acquisition is not as expensive as you think. I cannot ram that point home. Uh, I cannot ram that point home strongly enough. Also, with the appropriate sensors, you can actually reverse engineer the characteristics of your car. And indeed, one of the things about chassis sim is because of the fact of where it started, because it started from the lower to mid-level formulas and progressed above, we had to get very, very good at using a limited data set. Now, I actually regard that as a blessing. And the reason I regard it as a blessing is it's a, it allowed us to be really laser focused on the stuff that counted. Also too, it takes out the guesswork and saves unnecessary spending because one of the worst things you can do if you are not logging appropriately, when you start spending 10,000 euro for, when you start spending 10,000 AUD, 10,000 euro for a day of testing, if you don't have the appropriate logging, you, uh, you know, you know, you're not making the most of that time. And this is where good data acquisition is worth its weight in gold because with good data, it adds so much value to a test session. Also, with the deluxe option, you can add as you go. You don't need to do this all in one hit. But I think for me, though, the real question we need to ask is why wouldn't you do it? So at that point, let me conclude this tutorial and we will catch you in the next um, episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner and the next Chassis Sim tutorial.